Next, on Viewpoint. In a complicated culture of hate and racism, this pastor says love is still the answer. Much of the problem of America has come because of the failure in the pulpit. And a former TV journalist says our culture is still sacrificing our children to false gods. We're sacrificing children now to what God? I think it's the God of convenience. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Our country seems to be closer to tearing itself apart more than ever in history. Violence and hate speech not only about race, it now includes mainstream politics, gender equality, gangs, and of course religion. With me today is Bishop Ronald Hill, and he's seen some of the worst of this violence, but le believes that love is really the answer. His church, Love and Unity Fellowship, is located in Compton, California, and that's where he joins us from today. Pastor, thank you for being with us again. Well, I'm glad to be with you again. Now, we talk about, uh, about reaching everyone with love, and the name of your church is Love and Unity Fellowship. Uh, it seems like a strange title in the center of Compton, California, where there's been <laughs> a lot of violence in the past. Yeah, well, it did have a lot of violence in the past. Um, I was just thinking a moment ago, um, uh, years ago, when we first started ministering in Compton, the helicopters would be over two or three times a week. There were shootouts daily, and it was a very dangerous place uh, uh, to be. In fact, I got shot at in, in the city of Compton. The bullets came so close to me, I had lead caught up in my jacket. So that was kind of like a, a challenging situation for me. So what we decided to do was we decided that we were going to start fasting and praying. So what we did was every month we'd have what we call a shut-in. And we'd go into the church and we'd stay in the church two nights. We'd start fasting uh, on, on a Wednesday night. We'd go into the church on a Thursday night and we'd stay there until Saturday morning with continuous prayer. We set up a 24-hour prayer visual, fasting and praying and asking God to move in the city of Compton. Uh, in the process of doing that, I had purchased a building that was used by the gang bankers to make money. They would sell drugs out of it and have prostitutes working out of it. And, and it was old uh, dance hall. We bought it and converted it into a church. So they were angry with me and I didn't even know it. So what they did was they broke into our church building, stole our piano. When they stole our piano, um, I must admit to you, I got angry. And before I knew anything, I had walked down the street where they were and I'm, I'm not proud to say this, but I went down and I used the N-word against them. And I told them that I was tired of them and, and how dared them to break into the church. And when I said that, they pulled their shirts back and their jackets back and began to show me their guns. And boy, by then I'm thinking, I came to myself. I said, now, what am I doing down here? Around 15 or 20 young men scolding him about breaking into the church. So what happened was the head gangbanger, you always can tell who he is because everybody's just around uh, him and he, he's a shot caller. The head gangbanger told me, he said, Reverend, go on back down to your office. I got this and you'll get your piano back. And when he said that, it, 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 it mystified me. I, I wonder, you know, why did he say that? Of course, I was glad to get out of that, out of that circle. I came back down to my office a few hours later, uh, I got my, my piano back. They told me where it was, I got it back. Later on, I discovered that the head gangbanger had come through the juvenile hall system. I had counseled him some seven years before. He was in juvenile hall for murder. I had sought to lead him to the Lord. I prayed with him and ministered to him. I didn't lead him to the Lord, but he remembered me. I didn't remember him because of talking to so many kids. So later on, I know that my life, I believe, was spared because of having ministered to that kid and he recognized me. He made them give the pee on the back. And then things broke. We began to lead some of the gangbangers to Christ. Some went to, went to prison. Some got killed. Some joined the church. And that whole gang was, was disbanded in that area. And then we began to preach on street corners in Compton. We began to knock on doors in Compton. In fact, we knocked on every door in the city of Compton three times. And then we started giving away food and clothing and, and having street services. And today, Compton is nothing like it was before. 
I'm reminded now of Chicago. I really do believe that if the pastors and preachers in Chicago would begin to fast and pray on a regular basis and would go to the streets and began to seek to win these young men to Christ and to pray against that murdering spirit that they could bring about a change, a change in the city of Chicago. Well, you mentioned what's happened in Compton and what you're, you're, you think could happen in Chicago. Could it really happen around the United States when we look at all the violence, the gang violence, the, the hate speech that's going on among uh, even, even Christians sometimes? What's it going to take to break through that? I mean, with you, it was fasting and prayers. You think that's going to work every place? Yeah. Well, I, I believe that the problems of America, and I, I don't want to attack anybody. because I'm not an attacker person. I'm not a person that attack others. Uh, but I must say that I believe that much of the problem of America has come because of the failure in the pulpits. I believe that the, pulp, the, the pulpiteers, the people, the men and women who stand behind the pulpits of America, we dumbed Christianity down to the degree that we did not magnify the fact that primarily the Church of Jesus Christ is about promoting the gospel, making disciples, and helping the poor. And we have done a very, very poor job of promoting the gospel in America. It's, all, it's almost as if we are ashamed to tell people about the gospel of Christ. And if everybody in America who claim to be Christians would win one soul a month and disciple that one soul, we could change America almost overnight. But the church is emaciated. The church is carnal. The church isn't praying the way it should. And Lord knows that we're not seeking holiness the way we should because I'm a firm believer that if you live holy, love everybody, and give yourself to prayer and fasting with the right motive, the right motive has to be, in my opinion, so that God can be glorified. And secondly, so that God can make you a blessing to others, particularly in the area of, of sharing the gospel of Christ and uh, uh, encouraging those persons to be a part of the church. Like, for example, uh, a few weeks ago, we had an outreach on our parking lot where we gave away, we spent about $40,000 of, of the church's funds. We had over 200 brand new bicycles. We had over 200 skateboards and, 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 and um, scooters. We gave out over 200 vouchers for $25 each for people to go get food. We gave out over, over 1,100 hygiene packages 1100 uh, backpacks full of school supplies, haircuts, the whole, we did the whole thing on our parking lot. And we had over 500 decisions for Christ, and most of oh, them wow. were children. And so I believe that the Bible says that one plant, another waters, and God gives increase. I believe that if the church would stop focusing on getting rich and famous, and stop focusing on money and prosperity, and start focusing upon living holy, and loving one another, and getting out there and promoting the gospel that we can see a change in America. Wow. Well, you've seen a change, you've seen a change in Compton. Uh, you talked about you've, you've been out to the, knocked on every door in Compton at least three times. How do you get the, the, the congregation to really grab a hold of that message that you're putting out there? I mean, that, that isn't just one or two people going out there. That's a whole congregation yes. getting into and, a city. And, and I must how tell do you, you. How do you get them excited about it? Well, another thing is, uh, about 15, 20 years ago, God told me, he, he said, I want you to put a man on staff, full-time paid staff, and his job description would be to go to the streets. So now I have a man and a woman who are on paid staff, and their job description is to take volunteers from the church and other churches as well and go to the streets of Compton and to go door to door. Uh, several times a year, we get on 12 different street corners. We have 12 bullhorns, and we get on 12 different corners, and we have workers around them. We have people preaching from the corners and others passing out tracts and praying with people to receive Christ. And I've had pastors that say to me, well, Pastor Hill, how do you get the people to do it? And the answer is very simple. You do it yourself because I am committed to it. I do it myself. And there will always be others who will catch it. Visions are caught, not taught. 
And when you have a vision and you walk in the vision and you teach it, other people will gravitate toward it. Well, you, you go out and knock on a door and somebody answers. You have no idea who they are, whether they're a gangbanger or whether they're a, 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 a mother that's got four children in the house. What's the message that you're going to give them to grab a hold of them? Well, I have a technique that, uh, of course, as, as I said earlier, I've been involved in personal evangelism since 1971. I quit a job in 1972 to be a personal worker. One of my greatest approaches that I've had, and matter of fact, I've been cursed out, I've been threatened. Uh, I remember a man looked at me in my eyes and he told me to get that blankety blank out of my face. And I could see in his eyes that he meant business. I got in my car and drove away. So it's dangerous. But one of the best approaches that I've come up with over the years is that I approach a person, I would say, hello, I'm Pastor Ron C. Hill. May I please pray for you today? If I approach 10 people and identify who I am and inform them that I want to pray for them, nine out of 10 will say, go ahead. And in the process of praying for them, I pray for their health, their wealth, their families. I pray that they be protected from evil. And then I pray when they die, and I pause, when they die, I pray that they'll go to heaven. Then I stop praying and I look at them because in the midst of the prayer, I give the gospel. I talk about the death of Christ, the blood of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. I put all that in the prayer. And at the end of the prayer, then I began to talk about death. And then I stopped and I looked them in the face and I said, well, if you died right now, where would you go heaven and hell? And you'd be surprised the number of people. I've had people to take the index finger and say they'd go straight to hell. Others would say, well, I'm going to heaven because I've been nice and I've been good. And it gives me a chance to, to again, to give them the gospel and to pray with them to receive Christ as Savior. Otherwise, if they say they don't want it, I smile and walk away. So it's, there's danger involved. You, you can't do the work of God in certain areas without facing danger. But I take the position, I can't die to God says so. And to think if I died sharing Christ's gospel with a sinner, what a way to get out of here, praise God. What's the vision that you're sharing with your, with your congregation today? You've, you've had some success in Compton. How are you, how are you keeping that vision alive? And what, what's the vision that you're sharing with your congregation today? You know, believe it or not, I, I have come to believe that one of the most misunderstood messages from the Bible would be the gospel. You have so many people who are attempting to be pleasing to God through their own effort. And, and sometimes they don't even recognize that they're doing it. So, so I've been preaching heavily lately that I did not become a sinner, nor did anyone else become a sinner by sinning. We became a sinner because of the action of Adam. Adam is the one that plunged humanity into sin. I was not there. I did not enjoy that fruit that he consumed, but he consumed it on my behalf. Therefore, I and everyone else was born into sin. So I was dead in trespasses and sins because of the action of Adam, but I had nothing to do with it. However, I was born into sin. And by the same token, when Christ Jesus suffered, and bled and died on the cross. I was not there, but he did it in my place. He was wounded for my transgression. He became sin in my place. God put all of his wrath on Jesus on my behalf, and Jesus took that wrath. Now, after Jesus died, of course, he arose from the dead on the third day, and I believe that, and the moment I believe that instantly, I am snatched out of the kingdom of darkness, and brought into the kingdom of God's dear son with perfect salvation. Then once the congregation began to realize that we have perfect salvation, that we did not earn, that we cannot add to, that we cannot subtract from, now they need to learn how to defend themselves, how to use their faith to defend themselves against the attacks of the enemy, and how to use their faith to claim the promises that God has given us. The Bible says, according to God has given us uh, the, the power of God, that we may be partakers of his divine nature. Through the power of God, we are now a part of the very nature of God. And so we need to learn to use our faith 
to walk that out, which will lead to a life of love and a life of holiness. So when you get enough people congregating together who understand the concepts of walking in love and walking in holiness and they're gospel promoters, then you're at the top of your game there. You've done the best that you can do. Only thing you can do is add more to that very principle that they have been taught. Well, Pastor, it's been great having you today. Where can, where can people learn more about uh, the church in Compton and, and your personal testimony? Well, they can go online and, and, and find uh, Compton, I mean, excuse me, can find Love and Unity, a Christian Fellowship of Compton, California. They can go online. They can see something about the ministry, about what we are about, what we are attempting to do, and uh, they can be blessed by that. Coming up next. We're sacrificing children now to what God? I think it's the God of convenience and expediency again. I, I think it's the God of uh, getting over and doing our own thing. That's coming up next on Viewpoint. In ancient times, people actually, as cruel as it seems, actually sacrificed their children to, to, a, to a God that they had created either to curry favor from that God or maybe to pay for some sin from that God. And with me today is Bill Harris. And Bill, uh, you've studied a lot of this. Are we mm -hmm. still doing this today? I mean, at that time, they were sacrificing their children to a God named Moloch mm -hmm. to curry favor from this God. They were, and, and what I see today, well, first, just a little bit of background on Moloch. He was made of brass, mm -hmm. false God made of brass, uh, had a head like, like a calf. A, like and a calf. Uh -huh, and a crown, yeah. crown on his head. He was hollow in the, on the inside because the, the, the priest of Moloch would kindle a fire inside the hollow image, and when the flames would come out of his belly, his, and they had his arms stretched out like that, it was the role and the responsibility of the father to take the firstborn child out of the arms of the mother and lay it on the arms of Moloch to be sacrificed by fire. To be consumed to by be the fire. To be consumed by fire. Yes, it was. And, and God uh. talked about how he detests this in several Old Testament scriptures, some in the New Testament, mm -hmm. uh, Moloch, M-O-L-E-C-H, or M-O-L-O-C-H, or another name was Milcom, M-I-L-C-U-M. Mm -hmm. Now, who's, who was actually doing this? What, what people were, were believed were, that Moloch was going to give them some favor for this? There were, there were neighboring tribes that did it, but on occasion, we see scriptures where the children of Israel did it actually as well. It. Yeah, outside the south, the south wall uh, of the walls around the city of Jerusalem, outside there in what is called the Valley of Hinnom, from which we get the word Gehenna, which means um, hell. It was terrible. My contention, Bob, is that we are still sacrificing children on the arms of Moloch. And I say I we're sacrificing. We, where do you see that happening You today? don't see it physically. But now, in the 21st century, we're sacrificing children on the arms of expediency and neglect. Wow. Look, at the look at the deplorable things that, 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 that are happening with our children today. Moms who are allowing their children now to decide for themselves their own sexual identity rather than mm -hmm. teaching the child of the sexual identity that's listed on his or her birth certificate. Uh, look at what's happening with the abortion. I mean, it starts in the womb. I mean, the killing of the yeah. unborn children. The, these children are being sacrificed for, for expediency so that somebody can maintain for their own life. Uh, convenience, exactly. Now, there's, there's a lot of politicians who say, well, I'll allow abortion in, in the cases of it's going to protect the mother's life. Yeah, yeah. But are, We're not uh, talking about that by and large. Yeah, and, and how many, what's the percentage of abortions that are done just yeah. because it's convenient? There you are. For convenience. Yeah. I, and I don't know the statistic <clears throat> on that, but we do know <clears throat> it's high, and, and, and that's exactly what is being done. Uh, the, the laws in, in marijuana that are being changed, and even children uh, are, are partaking of this. What about, what about there's a group that tried unsuccessfully, thank God, in Congress to have laws changed so that adults could have sex with children on down to the age of four. Namba, yeah. Nambia yeah. and also the Ren Guyon Society. Uh, those, those two organizations. Yeah. But see, th this, this is deplorable stuff we're talking about, but there's a mindset that feels that uh, sex trafficking of children, that, mm. that's another one that's going on. Now, what about things that aren't so deplorable? What about the things that say, uh, I I'm very, very busy with my life, yeah. and uh, yeah, that big screen right there. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I'll just set Johnny down yeah. here, and he can just spend the next That's eight hours happening. in front of that screen. Have you watched some of the cartoons that Johnny is watching today? I mean, some of these cartoons are promoting evolution and the like. Uh, they're, they're, they're talking about hitting, beating somebody up, and all those kinds of things in the name of fun, right. so to speak. All of this kind of negative exposure that our children are getting into that is altering their behavior. So do we have a God that we're sacrificing to? 
I mean, is there a God? I mean, they had Moloch, and they expected yeah. Moloch to give them some favor, or they were paying for some sin that yeah. they believed yeah. they committed. So they're, they had Moloch as a God. We're sacrificing children now to what God? I think it's the God of convenience and expediency mm -hmm. again. I, I think it's the God of uh, getting over and doing our own thing. I think it's the God of sometimes parents not wanting the role of parents, not wanting to do what it takes. Yeah, there are all kinds of gods that we adopt to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and and it's, it's deplorable. Look at the, the sex trafficking. You know, Toledo, where I come from, is a hub. Yeah. Is a hub for We're sex right trafficking. On I 75. I 75 in the yeah. turnpike and the yeah. like. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and all of this is taking place. And then we're, we're taking a look at opioid abuse opioid abuse, this, these, this, the abuse of the drugs that is taking place. Now let me put that in perspective because ch this can be an easy reach of children as well. Um, we're losing a thousand people every week due to opioids. A thousand overdosing people, or just, overdosing, just killing whatever. them in other yeah. ways. Yeah. So that's 52,000 a year. Now when you look at the Vietnam War, here's how you can yep. judge this. The Vietnam War lasted 10 years we lost 58,000 men and women, our finest. But that was 58,000 over a 10-year period. In the opioid addiction situation, we're losing 1,000 a, 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 a week. We're losing 52,000 every year. And, and in many cases, parents are having to relinquish responsibility of their children because they're so strung out on this. Yeah. There have been pictures in the media of parents who've just OD'd in a car and the children Kids. are in the back seat unattended. But there is hope. There is hope. I mean, we we, we look at what's happening right now. We look at the, the absence of fathers, whether they're workaholics and they've gone that way, or they're drug addicts and they've gone that way, or they just weren't in love and they went that way and left the kids with the mothers or yeah. left the kids to their own devices. How, yeah. do we, how do we get back from that? The I mean, we, this thing just seems like it's gone 190 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. And, but the hope <laughs> comes in those churches, those unsung, unsung heroes mm -hmm. in those churches who are taking a stand and are helping fathers to be fathers and helping mothers to be mothers. And there are institutions out there that are doing that. And if we can, if we can uh, do, what do you call it, revival, if we can do revival in a sense that we're reaching out to the world with love and bringing them into God's house and showing them and teaching them how to be parents. You know, I became a parent for the first time at age 21. I mean, you know, it, it was a frightening prospect. Same age I was. And, uh, yeah, see, <laughs> and, and we need to know from God's word. I, fortunately, I was a Christian and I began to learn those things. Mm -hmm. But I still made mistakes. I even, I've even had to go back to my kids from time to time and say, you know, my oldest son, Bill, mm -hmm. the third, I said, Bill, you know, your mom and I, we were extra hard on you because you were the first one. You know, you were the standard. I said, man, I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. I did. And you know what? It meant a lot to him Imagine when I said that. Him. It meant oh. a lot to him when I said that. Because we, it's a tough job and we need, and there's, but there's plenty in the Bible that talks about being a parent and bringing a child up in the way he should go. Even to the fact that where, where David said, bring a child up in, in, the, in the way he should go and he will not depart. Right. That means bring the child up in, in the natural bent of the child. Mm -hmm. That's what that means, literally. And it means if this child is bent on being a doctor, well, I have a niece, for instance, who at four years of age would rather watch doctors perform surgery on PBS <laughs> than watch cartoons. Well, you yeah. know what her bent was, uh -huh. and her parents began to bring her up in that natural bent. And it's working. She's a doctor. She's going to be a doctor. She's going to be a doctor. Yeah, she's still a teenager right now. Yeah. But she's going to be, and, and she's in special classes in high school that will prepare yeah. her for that, you see? And so when we have that kind of guidance with the child, and we seek the Lord about, well, what is the natural bent of this child and that child and the other child? And we spend time with that child lovingly and talking to that child and not yelling and screaming. I've been guilty of that too. Yeah. And not yelling and screaming, but talking to the child and, and, and just admonishing the child lovingly. It has a difference. Okay. It has a difference. Okay, there's a parent out there right now. I don't know if it's a single mom. I don't know if it's a father. The child's gotten away from them. They, they realize mm -hmm. they're guilty. They realize that I've, I've done some bad parenting here. I've, I haven't brought them up in the way that, that I should have, but now I realize that the child is out here someplace. Yeah. I mean, they are gone. Mm -hmm. How do you get them back? Well, you know, physically. I mean, the, the, the parent 
has to repent first. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. got to start there. That the you, parent you realizes there. that they've they've done it wrong. Took the words right out of my mouth. It, because if you don't acknowledge your own wrong, how, how are you going right. to reconcile with the child? So you acknowledge your own wrong, and you ask God to help you to find that child. Mm -hmm. And there have been incidences, there have been stories where parents has, have gone out and successfully found their child and brought that child back home and reconciled with the mm -hmm. child. Because not all the time is it the child's fault that there is a breakup right. between the parent and the child. In many cases, it is the, the, the parent that, that is at fault. Right. And, um, and the parent has to be, I would say, big enough to acknowledge their own wrong. I, I had to do this, I, I learned to do this with all five of my children. I bring them in, sit them around the fireplace, and, and my wife and I had gone to a seminar, and we learned some things, and we came home and sat them down, and we apologized for some things, because mm -hmm. we had just come into the knowledge of the truth of that, and we had to apologize. Yeah, I find myself apologizing a lot more to my daughter yeah. sometimes than I wanted to. Yeah, my daughter and I yeah. were on the phone, she's and in Dallas, son. Yeah, and we were on the phone, and she said, well, Dad, we used to have those moments. I said, yeah, fathers yeah. and daughters had those moments. Yeah. I said, but look at us now. Yeah. Look at us now. And that works the, 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 the other way around for that prodigal child. Uh, they want to come yes. back. Yes. And they think, okay, how do I, how do I make, make up all of that ground? Do they have to cover all of that ground to come back? Or can Christ just bring that re reconciliation back? You know, Christ can bring that reconciliation back. The, the, the two parties have to be willing for it to happen mm -hmm. and to be willing for, uh, uh, to, to let that past go by the wayside and not bring it up and smear each other's faces with that past, you know, just go, go on from there. Not, not acting like the, it didn't happen. You address those hurts and those disappointments and those, those harsh words that were said toward one another. You have to address that. That's a part of the healing mm -hmm. process. But then you want to move on and not drag the past into the present and the future with you. Today you may have heard some viewpoints different than you've ever heard from your friends, family, or even the church. Well, the point of our program is to have our guests explain their opinions based on their experiences and their faith. One thing we want to be clear about is that we believe the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible says that people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Well, we hope this program gives you a bit more insight into what the Bible says and that it's relevant for your life today. If you want to know more or watch other interviews on demand, go to our webpage or our Facebook page. I'm Bob Placey. Join me on the next Viewpoint.